I'm Justin Moss, and here today considering Werther, Jules Massinet's opera, which will close Florida Grand Opera season uh, in just a few weeks. This is a remarkable piece you don't get to see very often. It requires truly heroic artists, and it also is a very, very special kind of a piece for many reasons that I think it'll be interesting to consider for a couple of moments. Werther, the opera by Massinet, actually took well over 10 years to find its place in the repertory. People didn't quite know what to make of it. Uh, some people thought it was too persistently gloomy, and it certainly was a huge risk that Massinet took in creating this kind of a sustained mood for an entire opera. But it finally found its footing and began to attract some of the leading artists in the world who wanted to seize the opportunity to portray these remarkable individuals. Werther is based on Goethe's novel, The Sorrows of Young Werther, which is in large measure, uh, at least partly, autobiographical. At the ripe old age of 23 in 1772, Goethe had fallen in love with a woman he was desperate to marry, and she ended up marrying somebody else. It was a devastating experience for him and a major setback in his young life, he thought at the time. A friend of his, though, had in despair fallen in love with a married woman, not, not available to him, of course, and became so manic and so depressed that he ended up killing himself. Um, he actually wrote a note to Goethe's friend, who married the woman Goethe loved and wanted to marry, asking to borrow his pistol, saying he was going on a very long journey. And uh, the friend loaned this boy the pistols, and with them he took his own life. These were formative experiences, shattering, and it's clear that Goethe never really got over it. Uh, the note that this young man wrote, asking to borrow the pistols, actually has survived to this day, and it's quoted verbatim in both Goethe's novel and in Massenet's opera. When The Sorrows of Young Werther was published, it created a sensation all over Europe. It was translated into almost every language. People read it like crazy, and it was hugely controversial in that it appeared to condone suicide. Werther, brokenhearted at his inability ever to possess Charlotte, the woman he loves, kills himself, and it seems that in this novel that that was sort of a logical conclusion, the thing he had to do. There was no other path open to him. It didn't work for the church, though, and it is said that an entire Italian edition of The Sorrows of Young Werther was surreptitiously bought up by church authorities to keep it out of circulation. The novel was also blamed for a wave of suicides among young men all across Europe. I think in retrospect, and if we could conduct a scientific survey of the evidence, we would come to the conclusion that sadly, suicides always occur among young men. And at this particular time in the 1770s, almost everybody who read had read The Sorrows of Young Werther. So as young men committed suicide, as some are wont to do, it so happened that most of them had read the novel, and thus the novel was pointed to as the cause and the suicide the effect, and therefore seemingly justified a ban of circulating this piece of literature. All of that played out uh, amidst a big stream of hysteria, as you might imagine, but a hundred years passed, and all of that had really significantly died down when Massenet began to ponder the idea of creating an opera based on this story. It had been done before. Both plays and operas had been created based on that work, but none of them had really survived. And uh, Massenet, late in life in his memoirs, liked to um, portray that he threw the opera together in less than a year, and it was an immediate success, and, and et cetera, et cetera. None of that is true, of course. And uh, he pondered it for about seven years, worked on it for many, many years. When he finished it in 1887, it was rejected by the Opéra Comique, one of the opera houses in Paris, as simply being too gloomy. And the text went into a drawer, 
and Massonet went to work on other pieces. He wrote Esclarmonde uh, during this hiatus, if you will. And uh, Manon, his most popular opera, had had a recent success in Vienna. They asked for another opera, and he simply opened the drawer, pulled out that completed score of a few years earlier, and delivered it up. The first performances of Werther were given in Vienna in a German translation, if you can imagine it being the most French of all French operas, perhaps. Uh, as I said, the piece took some years to get on its feet and find its place in the repertory, but it finally did. And it has become today a special event. When Massenet's Werther is being done, opera lovers make a point of often traveling great distances to go and to hear it. We have a wonderful cast of magnificent artists who are performing in this production at Florida Grand Opera, and uh, we've already had a lot of inquiries from around the country of real opera fans saying, I'm going to be there. I just, I can't miss it, and uh, let me have a ticket, and we're happy to provide them with one. The opera is a miracle in many respects. One, in that Massenet is able to sustain this prevailing mood so effectively that we're really present in it along with him. And two, that he is so spare. He has a fabulous libretto that was provided to him. Uh, it trims away all of the extraneous stuff that is a distraction. So the text is very, very spare, leaving a lot for the music to do. And the music does a lot. And it's refreshing. There are very few sections where more than one voice is singing at a time. Much of the opera gives the effect of a written through conversation of people exchanging ideas, uh, not necessarily listening to one another, uh, seemingly at times determined to make each other as unhappy as they possibly can. And they succeed pretty spectacularly, if I do say. Um, I think, though, for me, the third act of this opera, which we'll discuss in just a minute, is one of the true miracles of all time created for the lyric stage. The opera opens in a pastoral setting. There is a house and we have a magistrate, a mayor, if you will, who has been widowed. And his oldest child, Charlotte, a beautiful young lady, has inherited upon the death of her mother the responsibility for her young siblings. And so she is raising them, taking care of them, feeding them and whatnot. And uh, it so happens that there's going to be an important ball in the village that night. Charlotte has been engaged to marry a young man by the name of Albert. And in the opera, she has promised her mother on her mother's deathbed that she would marry Albert. And this she intends to do. Albert's been away on a trip for six months, though. And in his absence, it's been arranged that a dashing young man by the name of Werther will accompany Charlotte to the ball this evening. Uh, the guy is politically well-connected, he's handsome, uh, he's rich, and an interesting character, and everyone thinks it's going to be kind of fun for him to escort Charlotte to the ball this particular evening. Um, Werther shows up to pick up Charlotte. He's entranced watching her feed the modest supper to her siblings. And for him, this whole vision is the ideal portrait of innocent love. And the very thing his life is focused on attaining. And here it is, right before him, uh, complicated, however, by the fact that she's engaged to marry someone else. Werther goes off to the ball with Charlotte. The children are left behind, and uh, the mayor, Charlotte's father, goes off to join some friends in a tavern. In the absence of Werther and Charlotte, Albert unexpectedly returns. He comes to the house, sees the children, and asks them if he's still remembered. Absolutely, they say. We do nothing but wait for you and make plans for your upcoming marriage to Charlotte. He inquires as to where she is and is told that she is off at the ball. And he goes off saying, please announce that I have returned and I will be back tomorrow. We now have an incredible scene that closes the first act. Charlotte and Werther are returning from the ball and the moon is up and big and bright. And in this intoxicating moonlight to a magnificent lilting melody 
that Massenet has composed, the couple comes back to the home, and clearly there's been a great, great attraction between them. The first words of this scene, though, are uttered by Charlotte, and they're uh, fraught with meaning, and she turns to Werther and begins the scene by saying, we must part. And, of course, he realizes that this is true, but he begins to profess his attraction to her and to praise her qualities. And she says, how can you know these things? You don't know me at all. And, and what basis do you have to be so attracted? Plus, I promised my mother I would marry Albert, and this I am going to do. Uh, it starts to get out of hand, though, and Charlotte realizes the prudent thing to do is going to be to separate and get him out of there. So she takes her leave and Werther is left alone to wonder what in God's name he's going to do, finding himself in this absolutely untenable situation. The second act takes place uh, in a church. It's a great celebration, the 50th wedding anniversary of the minister, if you will, and people are very excited about it. And Charlotte has now been married to Albert for a period of three months. And together they go to the celebration at the church. Albert questions Charlotte as to whether she's happy, and she assures him that she absolutely and certainly is happy. Um, after the celebrations, though, at the church, Werther shows up, and he's clearly desperate, not knowing quite what to do. Uh, Albert talks with him, though, and explains that he knows how Werther must feel, because he himself was so attracted to Charlotte, and he believes that Werther was, and he can understand his pain, can feel his pain. Um, Werther is not entirely sure that that's true and that he can, but at any rate, Albert assures him that, you know, things will work out and they value him as a friend. Charlotte comes upon the scene, sees Werther, and they talk quietly, and she realizes it's a situation that's now likely to spiral out of control. She tells him that they really need a separation now, and that he should go away. Uh, not forever, though. Perhaps, maybe, he could return at Christmas. So, she suggests this idea, implants it in his head, and he finds himself in abject and total despair. The third act opens with Charlotte at Christmas, at home, rereading letters she has received over the months from Werther. She's completely torn, thinking, maybe she does love him. Maybe she made a great mistake by rejecting him and honoring her pledge to her mother and marrying Albert. And as she rereads these letters, she becomes increasingly despondent until finally she's literally in tears. Her young sister Sophie comes in upon the scene, sees her sister crying and says, what's wrong? What's happened to you? And Charlotte sings the most magnificent aria and it's a curious, curious thing musically and, and a miraculous composition in its effectiveness. Massenet for the first time scores a part in an opera for a saxophone. Adolf Saxon invented the saxophone about 40 years earlier, but it had never been employed by an opera orchestra. Here, though, for this particular scene, Massenet has composed an alto sax obbligato to accompany Charlotte as she sings this aria and explanation to her sister, saying that the tears that we do not shed, the tears we withhold in our heart, gather force and begin to weaken the heart until it becomes so brittle that it is destroyed and now everything breaks it. It's a beautiful, beautiful, special moment in all of the opera. Be sure to listen for that first use of a saxophone in an opera score. Pretty soon though, Werther shows up. It is after all Christmas time and she had suggested to him that it probably would be a good idea to wait until Christmas before he returned and now here he is. They try to maintain a polite level of conversation, obeying all of the strictures of society, how much the children are looking forward to seeing him, how nothing has changed, the harpsichord is still here, uh, Albert's pistols are still on the wall. And from this, Charlotte attempts to distract their terror, prudently, by pointing out a volume of 
poetry, allegedly by Ossian, which is another long story. Uh, but it was something that, that uh, Werther had begun to translate at one point. He draws the volume down and begins to read from it and sings his famous aria, Pourquoi me réveiller? And he begins to read, he says, Why should I respond to the call of spring when I know it only presages the storms of winter? It's a magnificent aria with big ringing high notes and is in fact sort of a toe dipping into the pool of verismo. It's so impassioned and so gripping and uh, a really, really true high point in every performance of this opera. He delivers this impassioned thing and Charlotte discovers her will has just crumbled. Her resistance is completely gone and for a brief moment the two of them fall into one another's arms. She realizes what she's done and instantly pulls away. And now with all her, with the willpower she can summon, she tells Werther they need to never see each other again. And he says, never, never, she repeats. And he realizes that it is now a done deal. In great desperation, he leaves. Albert comes, begins to speak with Charlotte, and he begins to interrogate her. He knows that Werther has shown up, and she's trying to not disclose how close she came into failing to uphold her vows of fidelity, but suddenly a messenger comes with a note, and this is the famous note quoted verbatim in which he asks to borrow Albert's pistols because he's going on a very long journey. In a moment of almost unspeakable cruelty, Albert reads the note and then instructs Charlotte to hand the pistols to the messenger. This she does. The messenger goes off to deliver the pistols to Werther, and the minute Albert is out of sight, Charlotte grabs her coat and hurries off into the cold winter night, hoping she's not going to be too late. In the last act, of course, she is too late. She comes to Werther's place and finds that he has shot himself and he lies dying. He begs her not to call for help. He knows that this is the only path that he can take. She stays with him and they sing together of the truth that they in fact did love one another. She confesses now that she did love Werther. It's of course all too late and it is uh, hopeless for Werther and Charlotte stays with him during this incredibly painful scene while Werther's life ebbs away. And as he dies, the chorus of children, the siblings of Charlotte and friends are outside singing a Christmas carol, which Charlotte's father had been coaching them on at the very, very beginning of the opera. Now, as Werther dies, we have children singing of the celebration of Christ's birth. And this was a juxtaposition that the Romantics absolutely loved. And you know what? It's effective. It really works. I myself, at that very moment, have found the hairs standing up on the back of my neck as Werther dies and the children sing in complete opposition to the mood inside Werther's apartment at that moment. This is a great, great masterpiece. It's a mid-career opera for Massenet. Uh, he surely went on to write technically more advanced things, uh, maybe more accomplished scoring for the orchestra and so forth. But of all the operas, 30-some, that he composed, he wrote nothing truly as great and as heartfelt as Werther. It's a special work in the whole of the repertory, and Florida Grand Opera is proud to present it to you, our patrons, to conclude this marvelous season. <laughs>